I am so excited to have a guest on the show today who is one of my close friends and music colleagues. She is a Grammy award-winning songwriter, founder of Liz Rose Music Publishing Company in Texas, Heritage Songwriter Hall of Fame inductee. A frequent collaborator of Taylor Swift, she co-wrote 16 songs with Swift, including the number one crossover hits, Teardrops on My Guitar, You Belong With Me, and Grammy's 2010 Best Country Song, White Horse. In 2015, she won Song of the Year at Country Music Association's Awards and won Grammy's Best Country Song for the Little Big Town Smash, Girl Crush. Love that tune. She has celebrated cuts with Carrie Underwood's Cry Pretty and Kenny Chesney's Better Boat. Most recently, she has collaborated with Miranda Lambert, landing five songs on a new wild card album, including single, It All Comes Out in the Wash, which was Grammy nominated for Best Country Song in 2020. She has also penned songs for many other artists, including Tim McGraw, Dan and Shay, Allison Krauss, Blake Shelton, Leanne Womack, Chris Young, Gary Allen, Bonnie Raitt, and more. She is a dedicated contributor to the songwriting community in Nashville as a board member of NSAI, CMA, and most recently, one of two songwriters to be on the board of NMPA. Please help me welcome to the show the powerful and yet inexorably humble Liz Rose. Hey. Liz. <laughs> That's so weird sitting there listening to that. Is it? <clears throat> yeah, a little bit. Well, it's, it's funny reading those credits is exhausting. I mean, that's, I like to use the phrase, um, there aren't enough lifetimes and because it's, it's indicative of all the things we wish we could do and had time to do, but you sometime, some, somehow have managed to pack in 10 lifetimes worth into one. Well, I think you just stumble through it. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, what? Um, yeah, that's not even, there's two other boards I'm on as you were, doing that um three actually um yeah and and still uh, managed to have somewhat of a life yeah, if i do. was gonna say anything about what's going on right now is like it's afforded me to do all those things and have a life and be at home hmm. which is crazy did you ever think you'd be here when you listened to that did you no 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 no, no. no. i was i i mean i just started writing because somebody said they'd pay me extra money <laughs> to do it. So I was like, okay, I could use a little bit of money extra every month. So um, never planned on making a living at it or anything. I just was trying to get by, keep the lights on, which I didn't always do. So, <laughs> Well, sometimes, I guess that's how a lot of the best things happen. You don't really even know you're doing it. But yeah, I, I would say if you thought you were going to make a living as a songwriter, don't forget it. Right, right. Yeah. You're probably lying. It's like love at first sight. Oh, yeah, really was it? Yeah. Did you really yeah. think you were going to make money as a songwriter? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. Take me back to, obviously, um, when you hear those credits, you there's I always think of credits as the tip of the iceberg. There's just so much that goes into everything to get to that point. So obviously, we could talk about a lot of those mountaintops, but take me back to the first time you got that first cut, that first buzz, whatever, no matter how small it was, what was the first thing where you thought this might be what they call a break or your first cut? Was it back in, was it in Texas or were you here? No, in yet? no, no, no. I, I didn't, I didn't write until I got here and that was purely by accident. Um, you know, I should remember that, shouldn't I? Um, I mean, I guess maybe Harmless Heart was one of the, was, I, I thought, okay, this is cool. I, I can, I can kind of do this. And uh, I was pitching songs and writing. So, and I loved that song and everybody loved it. But probably the, probably Billy Gilman, uh, Elizabeth, that was another, that was a moment where I thought I did something good. You know, I wrote it for my niece. So, you know, that's why you write songs. But it took a long time before I would say I'm a songwriter um, because I wasn't a songwriter. I was just... A publisher, right? I was a publisher. I was a song plugger. And I just happened to be pretty good at writing, and I don't know why. Um, so 
I think those things started adding up, you know, and I had a song called If That Chair Could Talk that got cut and everybody was talking about how much they loved it. And then finally, after you have all these little bits and pieces, you look at them and go, because they were all co-written with great co-writers. And I think you go, maybe I had something to do with that. You know, maybe mm-hmm. they weren't just being nice to me in the room because there, there is a common thread there. So that's probably, you know, back in those days. And, and then, you know, I got a Tim McGraw cut, All We Ever Find. It just kind of started adding up. Mm-hmm. But there were songs that I was really felt like I knew I was a big part of that I went, well, maybe I could do this a little bit more. Mm-hmm. Did you feel like the first few were, did you almost look at yourself and say, hey, maybe I was just kind of long for the ride with these folks that I do much? Or did you feel straight, straight from the get-go that you were holding your space in this and you felt? Oh, yeah. I mean, if I didn't feel like I had the idea and that lines weren't mine, you know, because I didn't play an instrument and I didn't sing, you know, maybe I felt like Mm -hmm. less, but even if you go back and hear those songs now, you go, Oh yeah, that Mm -hmm. is definitely, I can, I can hear Liz in there. Mm -hmm. So, um, I knew I was doing a lot in it. It just, you know, you just, you know, when you're, you're writing with people that have been, you know, struggling and writing since they were, you know, 10 years old to get to Nashville, you kind of, you kind of sit back and, and keep your mouth shut for a while. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So not playing an instrument, do you think in some ways that helps or, or, or let me, let me ask it this way. What ways do you think I remember having one of my mentors say, Jamie, find that thing that you look at and you think it might be a chink in your armor and flip it and use it to your advantage. Do you think that helps in some ways when you're sitting? I I love it when we're in sessions. I feel like you see things differently because of that, to be honest. Yeah, I mean, nothing gets in my way. I just go for the lyric and I'm not, sweating over the lyric because I'm trying to sweat over a melody and I'm not trying to find a chord or, you know, um, I'm just, the lyric is just coming to me and I'm just, it's just falling out. And then I have to, my biggest struggle is shutting my mouth and letting other people find the melody and the music before I run over everybody. You know, like I've been writing with this band and duo and we've literally been writing with no instrument and we're writing and then they're going and finding the music and the melody which is and and then they're changing it to fit what the, which is really cool but yeah I, I i mean i do wish i could sit around and pick up a guitar and sing and play sometimes you know but i just don't have time to i'm, I'm working on it you know but uh maybe by the time i'm 70 I'll be able to do that. But everybody goes, please don't pick up a guitar. Just, it will ruin your lyrics. It will ruin you. And nobody wants to give me a guitar lesson, you know, while we're trying to write a song. (laughs) There's nothing worse. You know how that is. When an artist goes, oh, what's that? You know, and they're just learning how to play guitar. You go, put it down. We need to write the song. Right, right. But. Yeah, I've always felt like you have this really unique perspective when it comes to writing because of, the instrument thing and because you embrace it. Um, and that gives you an incredible perspective on that lyric. But also I wonder too, if, if just coming from, you were a publisher first and yeah. I just. Yeah, that doesn't have anything to do with it. You don't think it helps? I don't think about being a publisher or a song plugger or anything when I'm writing. Do you think Not it helps you? I, I remember you saying once about the, the Taylor experience that you got out of the way. And I feel like sometimes when writers have been artists, they it's harder to get out of the way. Whereas you, I feel like you've always been really good at that. Just stepping back, it's easy for you, whereas it's not always for... Well, because I'm not an artist and I don't play guitar, because you know, everybody that plays guitar or piano has their sound. And mm-hmm. so they really want the artist to have that sound. So they're pushing them that way. Right. And because I don't do that, 
I don't have an agenda. My only agenda is to get them talking and write their story because I'm not an artist and I don't care. Mm -hmm. You know, and if I did make a record, it would be all my stuff anyway. I wouldn't, you know, be hard, you know, it's hard to co write that stuff without people you really know. So um, I never thought about that. The one thing I, I will say is that being a publisher, a great A&R person, Carol Ann Mobley talked to me and about songs and songwriting. And, and, she, and I remember her saying one time, you know, it'd be really cool if this song changed in the choruses, like you write a verse, but change the chorus every time. And, and that's kind of where, when I kind of got my, when things turned a corner was if that chair could talk. Because every verse and every chorus was different. And I can remember her going, oh, my God, you did it. I'm so proud of you. So um, that, was a, that was a good moment. But as far as, as uh, uh, you know, there would have been a lot of different things. Well, Taylor, for instance, wouldn't have kept writing with me. If I had to put a publisher's hat on <laughs> mm -hmm. um, or a plugger's hat, there are songs that wouldn't exist. I would have been picking it. I would have been overthinking it. And instead, I just let her write. Like, like Teardrops on My Guitar, we wrote. Well, one of the publishers wanted us to change it to you instead of Drew <laughs> so that it could be pitched if right. she didn't have a deal. And, and we were like, no, we're not changing it. And that's what made her stand out is that she did the name, you know, she was calling people out. So, you know, there's a lot of things that wouldn't have been said in those songs. Mm -hmm. Hey, folks, I want to talk to you a little bit about the sponsor for our podcast, Love Justice International. Love Justice International is an organization very, very dear to my heart. Did you know that 40 million people, as we speak, are living in slavery as a result of human trafficking in our modern day society? Um, Love Justice is an organization that actually attacks that trafficking, and they do it at its most strategic point while it's occurring, but most importantly, before the men, women, and children have been exploited. Uh, they're in 19 different countries, and in those 19 different countries, they've worked with authorities to arrest over 950 suspects and have prevented over 24,000 people from being trafficked. This is so very important. So if you get a second, please go to their website, lovejustice.ngo. And for just a couple bucks a month, a couple cups of coffee, you can literally stop a girl or a boy from being exploited or enslaved. Um, so once again, Take a minute, go to lovejustice.ngo, lovejustice.ngo. Do you, Thanks. What, what was the very first single of Taylor's that actually? Tim McGraw. It was Tim McGraw. Yeah. So take me back to when you were writing it. Did you, did you, did you know when you write it, hey, this is a hell of a song, this is a no brainer or? I thought it was strange. <laughs> right. I mean, when she tell, told me the title, I was like, okay, we're going to write a song about Tim McGraw. I guarantee you, she knew exactly what she was doing. I guarantee you, that girl saw so much. I, I bet you in that moment, she saw herself walking off the stage and singing that to Tim at an award show. That is how brilliant she is. Um, so I was brilliant in the way of just going with it and going, okay. We're going to write, you know, and, um, you know, even Jody Williams said, I think you're spending a lot of time on this. And I just kind of said, I don't care. It's fun. And I love her imagination and it's easy, you know, so um, I just hung in there. Do you think when, do you feel like there are some times when you're in the studio though, and you, and you write a tune and I mean, in some senses, you're writing so much that you almost have to forget the minute you walk out of the room because a lot of times you're jumping into another one and you're mm -hmm. finishing another one. Do you ever, do you ever know and say, if this one doesn't do some something, somebody fucked up? We do that all the time, and it and then and those are the ones that don't do anything. Mm -hmm. um, I will say that Karen 
said that about Girl Crush. Hmm. She said, this is a monster. And if we don't cut it, I'm going to make sure somebody cuts it. This is a monster. This is a huge song. We were like, okay. Uh, you know, we had just written it. We thought it was cool. Mm -hmm. We didn't know, you know. Um, so I think I got tired of my heartbreak, and I got over that. Honestly, I, it's the only reason I even go back. <laughs> it's terrible. Um, and listen to a work tape after is because I'm having to type the lyric or look for the song. But I got over that a long time ago. I just don't have that in me because it, it, it just pisses you off every time. It just sits there, you know. Um, or it gets put on hold immediately and it sits there for six months and then it's an old song and you find out that the record came out and your song's not on there. I don't care. Anymore. I just, I love the songs. They don't have to, they don't have to grow up and be beautiful and rich and mm -hmm. wonderful. You know, they're just, they are, I, I love them when I write them. I love it when I write it and that's good enough. You just got to let go. As a, I always thought that the percentages of baseball were incredibly intimidating. If you, as a baseball player, if you fail only seven out of 10 times that you get up to the plate, you're actually an all-star. Yeah. Uh, which makes, it, songwriting makes baseball look easy in terms of those percentages, doesn't it? Well, there's so many things that go into it. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like, um, well, oh, okay, for instance, I don't know why this song keeps coming up today, but If That Chair Could Talk, I thought it was the best song I I would ever write. And and it still holds up today. It's a great song. It was going to be, it was the label's favorite song. It was going to be Rachel Proctor's first single. It was going to, you know, do all these things. And then we declared war. And for some reason, because it said something about my brother joining the service, somebody said, oh, we got, that can't be this. It had already been shipped to radio. It was my break. I was finally going to be able to pay the bills. So there's so much that goes into it. Like you write all these songs with an artist and, you know, whoever you wrote them about, they broke up with. I mean, it's just, mm -hmm. we have no control. None. So true. That's so true. No control. Yeah. One of the things, as I was thinking about getting people in here to this bar and just talking a little bit, I uh, I mean, everybody talks a lot, especially these days. And I was thinking, how do, we, how do we talk and actually make it something that anybody would like to give a shit about? And I thought, you know, I just want to get people in here that are going to say what they think and be unfiltered and unsanitized. And so... I must say it is incredibly apropos that you are here in this bar <laughs> talking because I would say, <laughs> I would say one of the things, aside from being a world-class writer, I would say that one of the things that everybody would say about you, Liz, um, is that you, in a town that likes to tell people what they want to hear, you speak your mind. I, I, I do. I, I can't help it. I mean, I just, I mean, I like everybody. I don't have anything against anybody. My, I think I like to, I don't like to protect people. I don't really have that power, but, but I do like when people ask me a question or come and talk to me or, you know, and ask me what I think. I basically say, here's what I think. I may be right and I may be wrong, but this is what I think. So here's what you need to look out for. You know, how many times has someone come in and said, you know, I got this record deal and it's going to be, and I go, oh, okay, let's talk about that. Mm -hmm. You know, that's wonderful. That's incredible. But here are the things you need to be thinking about right now. You know, um, do you know this? Do you know this? And I don't know everything, mm -hmm. but I have to speak my mind because I will tell you that nine out of 10 writers are going to say, wow, that's awesome. Mm -hmm. You're in this room and we're writing and you've got a record deal. Don't do anything to screw it up. And I'm saying, make sure you have a great deal and it's fair and you know what you're doing. And, you know, we may write and you may never see the, it may never see the light of day, but man, I couldn't, I couldn't face myself if I didn't tell you 
what I know from the other side, Mm -hmm. you know, what Mm -hmm. that looks like. Right. Can you think of a time where that's come back to bite you? Can you think of a time where you were maybe talking to somebody on the other side, maybe, maybe somebody that's not in the writing room and you said, I could have just hurt myself or I said something I shouldn't have said? Well, I hope not. I mean, if it is, nobody's come back and told me off. Let I me mean, tell you a couple of lists. Can I, can I take a <laughs> second? I have a few me. written down. <laughs> um, but mine is not out of greed. Um, it's not out of greed or it, it, it basically just comes from a human place and a mothering place and a, a no bullshit place. Mm-hmm. And so, I mean, I, I, I could, you know, I'm sure I've been wrong many times, but at least maybe I said stop and think. And so maybe when somebody did something, did a deal, maybe they got just a little bit better deal mm-hmm. because I couldn't keep my mouth shut. Mm-hmm. You know, I mean, that's just where I come from. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. No, I'm... I'm, I'm, I'm not be- a shit talker. I mean, I, I don't think I am unless I'm really been drinking. But I do hope that whatever I say, I'll say to their to to the person. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. You know? Yeah. Or at least apologize. <laughs> yeah. No, you, you, you're, you're good at both. You, I've, I've heard you apologize plenty of times. I always think about how many people are going to show up at my funeral, and I think, hmm. You know, you don't want that empty funeral. Yeah. <laughs> no, yeah, I think you're, you're set there. Um, they'll they'll be looking to rent out St. Paul's Cathedral for years. Um, but Liz, ha- you work with, um, there are very few people who do both of these. You, you somehow bookend, you work with not only legends, people like the Mirandas and the Little Big Towns, but you also... You're, there's a talent to developing young talent. And I feel like you do that really naturally. Um, but because of that, you get to see a lot of really green artists. Yeah. And, and typically when these green artists, that managers, labels, agents, whoever it is, are running up the flagpole, just the percentages of that, it's going to be you know, one out of every... 30 of those is going to get to the next step than one out of everything, you know, so how do you, how do you balance that? You're seeing a lot of people who don't know what the hell they want to say at the beginning of their career. And then you're also jumping into these rooms with people who already are very, very successful. How do you stay? I've written with a lot of green artists with you and (laughs) you, obviously they're always insane singers, insanely talented, but you're always very patient, though I do have some great memories of little glancing looks that oh. you will always throw if we get a bad one. But um, yeah, do, some of them, yeah. H- how do you? I just don't know a lot of people in our industry that are that are bookending that wide of a continuum of 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 loving the development which you do, you truly love it. You're good in a room like that, but you also can jump in with Miranda and with, with Karen and, and exist as a, as a peer and a colleague. I think it's just getting people talking. You know, everybody's got a story. Um, I'm not always really patient, as, as patient as I should be, um, but I try. I try to get them talking, and tr- I try to get the story. Because you never know. Mm-hmm. I mean, yeah. you never know when that that one's going to walk in, you know. And and uh, so it's so fun to 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 meet these people and hear them sing, and um, and and you got to do that to stay fresh and to mm-hmm. keep moving, mm-hmm. you know. Um, I mean, that's, I think that's just what I do. I don't do it as much as I used to and as much as I like to. Um, but I do like to be known as someone that will write with a new artist. And I do like to be known as someone who will help a new artist. 
I mean, that's my job. That's our job. That's what we're supposed to do. If I ever got thought I was too big to write with somebody that was not didn't have a record deal and was unsigned, and and usually it doesn't pan out. They don't get a mm-hmm. deal, or they get a deal, and you know we know how it goes. And and then suddenly everybody's jumping on the bandwagon, and and you know I won't back climb. I just like. Mm-hmm. Y'all, go ahead. Y'all know where to find me. And that's just my attitude. Mm-hmm. So, but how how uh, sad if you weren't finding new talent and, you know, and, and getting to know these kids when they're new and they, they just, like, can't believe they're in town, you know? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, that's where the, uh, I mean, it feels like that's where you find out whether people are doing it because they love it or not. And if you... Yeah. If you love it, you will always write with new up and coming artists because that's that's what it's what you do. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, how how are you? How are you doing this COVID thing? Tell me how that's changed your writing process. I mean, I, everybody I talk to, it it's been a different experience for everybody in, in terms of that. Are you are you zooming a lot? Oh yeah, yeah. I mean, and every week is different. Mm-hmm. You know, like when it first when it first started, I think everybody was frantic and nobody wanted to cancel anything. And so everybody was, you know, I was writing every day. Um, you know, last week, I didn't, I don't, I think I wrote once last week. Um, this week, I think I'm writing, you know, a little bit more, but I think we're writing more purposefully. Um, it's easier. I mean, honestly, I love it. Do you? Yeah. Yeah. You know me. Well, you're hunkered down there at your at your place. Yeah, right? and I don't have to get in the car and find a parking place and look for lunch. And yeah. so I love it. And everybody's like, I miss people. I'm like, yeah, I really don't. But, um, you know, we can Zoom or we can talk. Um, but the, the, you know, the 30 minutes of shooting the shit in the office, oh, forget it. I'm so, I care you're never one for that you know and everybody going to get snacks and coffee it's like let's just write a song and then you can go do that yeah yeah hey folks one more shout out to our sponsor for the podcast love justice international love justice started 20 years ago when six college students decided that they would go to Kathmandu, nepal play soccer in the streets get to know the kids uh, of the city and in the course of doing this they really fell in love with Nepal, but also became aware of the scourge that really inflicts not just Nepal, but the surrounding region, and that is human trafficking. So as a result of seeing this, they tried to figure out what they could do and, and started the organization originally called Tiny Hands and now renamed as Love Justice International. Um, one of the other reasons why this is very near to my heart and why I'm so closely connected to it is one of those six college students was my little brother. And as a result, I really got to watch them over the years and how passionate and devoted they are to this cause. But not just that, but how effectively and efficiently they administer the the aid and the help towards um, eradicating slavery in the area. So I can't emphasize this enough. Uh, Go to the website, lovejustice.ngo, for just a few bucks a month, you can prevent a child from being trafficked or enslaved. It's, It's that easy. So lovejustice.ngo that's lovejustice.ngo Thank so you. the let's talk to Miranda Lambert record for a second um you had a incredibly heavy hand in her new album which i must say is there aren't a ton of good records these <sighs> days front to back and i just remember sitting out listening to that thing front to back when we were at at um, out by the pool for the listening party. I'm blanking on where it was, but- um, It's and, incredible. And just thinking this is a legitimate piece of work. It's an amazing, the songs were strong. The production was great. You have a song great. on there. I, I, it's I incredible. Got one, I got one. Um, but my, my, so you had five. Mm-hmm. Um, and my favorite song on that album, and I'm not just saying this, but I actually said it that night. And then I said it when she- had her showcase at Exit yeah. In. And I said, God damn it. I wish I wrote that song. 
And that's how a writer always knows it's a good song is when you think, God, I wish I would have written that one. And, and I know what song you're talking about because I'm glad I wrote it. Yeah. Okay. So my favorite song on that album is Dark Bars. And I mm. don't know if it's just because it's a hell of a song or because I spent half my life in Dark Bars. But it's an incredible tune. And I remember the first time I heard it, you got a tear. I hate to even tell you that because then you'll have one on me, but you got a little tear the first time I heard it. And um, yeah, so I think that, that that to me is a piece of, tell me about that song <laughs> in particular, because I feel like I, I remember a, a story, but tell me how it happened. It was New well, York, right? It was in New York. She, she uh, texted and said, hey, you want to come to New York and write? And I was like, yeah. And she, and she said, how about the Love Junkies? And I said, which I said well, I, let me check. And I called Lori. I think that I, I, I think I did. I, I can't really remember how, but they, we called in stages. Like Hillary wasn't answering, finally got hold of Hillary, but we didn't get hold of Hillary until I was already, because I literally flew out like that night or something or that day and then got hold of Lori. So Lori said, I'll get there when I can. And so I got there and she and I started just hanging out and drinking. And then we went and had dinner, and that's when we got a hold of Hillary and um, just basically <laughs> said, you can't say no, get on a plane. Lori's on her way. She'll be here tonight. Mm-hmm. Um, so we went back to Miranda's and started writing this song. And by the time Lori was there, got there, I was, I was pretty drunk. <laughs> I literally don't remember writing a lot of the song. Miranda went back in her bathroom and with a work tape, came back and said, I got a work tape. And I said, did we write a song? <laughs> and um, Lori loves to tell that. And um, so that's where it came from. And it was just Miranda talking and she just started playing guitar. And it, um, I just, I think we just drank a lot of vodka and I didn't, I was really surprised. You know how I am when, when we finish a song, I go, wait a minute, we've got a song. I can't ever believe it, you know, because mm-hmm. then it, you know, you you stumble and you fight and you, you know, try and get through that first verse and chorus. And then the second verse falls out and all of a sudden you go, oh, well, we've got a song. Mm-hmm. So that's kind of how that happened. But we had so much fun writing that, waiting on them to get there that, you know, the manager, Nancy, you know, she plays nothing but country. I mean, it just, it's such a great song. It ain't nothing fancy but the manager, Nancy. Uh, so good. She's an old jukebox junkie who plays nothing but country. We just had so much fun writing that song. Do you think writing in New York affected any of that? I mean, was that a, did the backdrop, I've always found it just so, such a poignant environment in new york city but you're writing country songs in new york city did it affect you guys yeah i mean we were in soho and nobody had to go home and um you know we had a a hotel that was just down the block and you know they're sitting on the fire escape and that's where fire escape came out came from and Mm. and how free that we wrote a song called fire escape that we were all like going well she's never gonna cut this This but it came out so lovely um so yeah we i mean we really had fun that was a great and we had already written uh too pretty for prison um uh all comes out in the wash Mm -hmm. and um uh, I can't think. My, I just went. Had you written blank. those? We wrote those here. here. Yeah, we wrote those here. Um, so that's when we wrote Fire Escape, and we wrote Dark Bars, and then we wrote a couple other songs while they were, while we were there. So thinking, as you mentioned, Fire Escape track record track that's record. It. Yeah. yeah. Okay. You mentioned Fire Escape, and I and I was picturing you guys in New York City and just seeing something, and it made me think of how I always am so scared by how random the process can be writing a song. You start with a blank page, yeah, and typically we like coming in with a blank page because then you get to react 
the artist walks in, they're wearing something different or the way that, especially with a new artist, they walk in and, and just their vibe is going to change. You hate to have something locked in stone before they walk through that door. But the randomness of how lines and titles and direction and how that verse almost made it but then we were walking out to grab a sandwich and somebody said this so we said oh let's just throw, toss that away you know it almost and then once you do that you're like it should have never been any other way it makes me sometimes feel like the song is always there we're just trying to yeah. find it and does that ever i mean when i think about fire escape and thinking about you guys just sitting there and you're you see that and it integrates into the song. It's just the randomness of... Well, and there was a book on the coffee table from the 60s in the, when um, it was an artist community, and they were all hanging out on the fire escape. Mm. So, so that's where the 60s hippies line came from. And, and Dark Bars, she, when she texted me, she said, we'll go drink in some Dark Bars. And I said, <laughs> and I texted her back, and I said, Dark Bars, we need to write that. And so we wrote Dark Bars when I got there. I am, once again, I'm just going to reiterate, I, there's no way I shouldn't have written a song called Dark Bars before you, given Isn't how many crazy? times I've been curled up in West. Well, not fair. You haven't been in enough Dark Bars, Liz, to... Oh, I did my time in Dark Bars. <laughs> <laughs> all right, well, I, uh, ask Tom James. He can tell you all about it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, we, what year did you move to Nashville, Liz? I always say I always say the same amount of years for about three years. Then I go, oh wait. I I think I think Caitlin was six maybe. Mm -hmm. Like twenty six years ago. And Caitlin, just to branch off, Caitlin is your daughter. Mm -hmm. Uh, for those who are listening, and Caitlin Rose is an incredible artist. She One is. of my favorites. She's been, she, she was, your daughter was doing, I always say that there were a few people doing indie music in Nashville. Indie country indie, music. Yeah, before the term indie even existed. And I feel like they were a select few. And it makes sense that Caitlin is, your progeny, because of course she was doing something before. It oh was, yes, it Caitlin was there. and Justin Townsend, uh -huh. and uh, oh gosh. Well, even Margot. I mean, Margot wasn't. I don't, I don't. She wasn't. I mean, she was in a band, but I mean, they all came up together. You know, mm -hmm. so it's, it's so fun to see that great group of kids. You know, Tristan. Um, Gosh, just just a great the, group. The, the ten out of ten folks, even during that time, were were doing yeah. a lot. The um, the butterflies and the yeah, Jason Isbell. That was you know Jay, way right. right. So um, yeah, um, yeah. Caitlin is has a new record coming out mm -hmm. too. So we're eventually uh, excited about that. They're wrapping um, it up. So you and I have never really fully talked about we've talked a little bit about taylor but um but tell me tell me uh more about so, so here's the funny thing is when you were working on that record with taylor i was working my first al album ever down the hall from you nathan chapman was in marathon village did you write at marathon village with nathan never nathan was two doors down from me at marathon village he was? That must have been the second record or something. It was It was the first. I remember him talking in the halls about it. Hmm. I, yeah, my my well, it could you could be right because Jody went to BMI. So you're probably right by the time they were working on the record, but all the demos were done at Jody Williams Music in the shack behind Jody's. Gotcha. Um so yeah, that could be that could be right. I I didn't really, I didn't really remember him being a marathon, but and not, and had you memory. had you had your that Billy Gilman cut? Had you had that prior to that? Yes, you had. Okay, and yeah. were you writing for? Did you get a publishing deal when you came to Nashville, or did you just come and just start? No, I was. Um, I, I 
I, I wanted the kids were in school, so I wanted to work. So I just kept looking for an internship. I was like thirty, and I was just trying. Well, I was thirty. Five thirty six, but I was just trying to get somebody to just give me a job. I was going to be a manager, which would have been terrible because I'm terrible at it. But, um, and I met this man, Ken Biddy, at a wedding, and he hired me to be a song plugger, which I did not know what it was, but I wanted a job, so I started doing that. And from there, I started a publishing company, just signed a couple of single songs. And from there, I started an independent plugging company for big writers. So I started pitching songs for Kent Blazy and Will Robinson and Jason Bloom, and um, and then from there, I you know I just kept starting publishing companies, and just fell into the writing. Started writing with one of my writers, hmm. and just kind of fell into it. And uh, the. the it was, King Lizard Music was my company, and it closed, and Jody Williams was buying the catalog. And he was signing one of our writers, Kim McLean, and he was listening to her catalog and realized that some of the songs I had written with her, and he really loved those songs as well. So he called me and talked me into being a songwriter, and he signed me as a writer. I didn't know that. Yeah. Jody Williams. He literally talked me into it. I did not want it. I said no. Wow. That's incredible. Yeah. Jody's a legend. I didn't know that he, he just literally another made notch me. on his belt. Wow. Yeah. It's incredible. And and so the the Taylor relationship, did you did I remember that you knew Taylor prior to writing with her or no you didn't? No, I did not. Um I, I had Leslie Roberts at the time was at RCA and Taylor was signed over there to a development deal. And um, Leslie kept saying, I've got this young girl, um, Taylor Swift, that I want you to write with. And I was like, okay, because I would just, I would write with anybody they asked me to. It was a record label. I was new. They, you know, knew I was, you know, good with these green, you know, kids. And so I just went, okay, I'll do it. And, um, I played a, a round, which was weird because I had never sung out before, but I did this round at RCA where they would bring in artists and managers to hear songwriters play songs trying to get cuts. And Taylor was there, and she came up and said, I like your song, a song called Nothing Will that I wrote with Mark Narmore. And she said, would you write with me sometime? Hmm. And I said, sure. We set it up, and we started writing, and... Um, I wasn't putting her in a corner and saying, sit over there, little girl, and we're going to write you a song. Uh, we just started writing, and, and then it got to a point where she was only writing with me. She was writing by herself and writing with me once a week. Hmm. That space, the, that safe spot, and that safe spot for young artists to be creative, it's such a vulnerable thing being in a room with someone, especially when you don't know them. It's like dating, and so when you provide that, I don't think people realize what an important aspect that is to providing that environment where they they can they can screw up, they can say things that are stupid, they can go down rabbit trails, and somehow that freedom is such an important. Yeah, she variable. was writing Taylor Swift songs. It, it's where I just got out of the way and just helped her bring these songs to life. Yeah, that's amazing. Um, you're you're good at that. I mean, you're <laughs> that's kind of the thing you do, aside from the songwriting. But it's it's like anything. There's so many more variables beyond just the putting the lyric. Which, by the way, did you bring a notepad? No. Why? So, one of the things I wanted to to touch on, just because it's one of your unique characteristics, your quirky characteristics, is your notepads. You're famous oh, for yeah. your notepads. And in a, in a day and age where we're all pulling out iPhones and the writing apps, everybody's got their best writing app that pops a little, little, little rhyme, what? rhyme a sister up on the side. What? <laughs> it's just the news to you. I, I'm still writing them on the yeah. paper, yeah. all my rhymes. Well, you're, you always garner a lot of attention because for those of you who are listening, Liz's notebooks are 
a cacophony of chicken scratches, <laughs> pencil so penned everywhere, upside down, sideways. Everybody's writing on their iPhones and their laptops. And, and Liz is pen to paper. And I challenge you to look at that paper or those sheets and be able to make any sense of it. But for some reason, Liz... Well, I, I don't make any sense of it. I just, everything that somebody says, I'm writing it down. And Kim McLean taught me to do that. So I have to give her credit yeah. because we got together after not writing together for 10 years. And she, we start, both are doing the same thing. And she looked at me and I went, wow, I learned that from you. It was mm. so crazy. But... um yeah, it's a mess, but there and it's real funny because I'm the most disorganized person you'll ever know. But that's the only thing I'm organized about is that my songs are in chronological order. I never tear a page out of my book. My son and I, Scott, who runs a publishing company, got in the biggest fight um, at a retreat because he wanted to make a grocery list. And he tore a page out of my writing book. He wanted to see and it. I went berserk. Yeah, yeah. And so, and it's so bad that the other day my daughter said, Mom, I'm so sorry, but Rosie, my granddaughter, she may have halfway torn a page in your writing book. Oh, I'm so no. sorry. And I was like, it's fine. It's a piece of paper. So it's okay. The grandkids can do whatever they want. But, yeah, um, they get away with it. But uh, I said, is it still intact? And she said, halfway. And I went, okay, it'll be fine. <laughs> so weird about it. So, so the progression of songs in the notebook is very organized, but on the particular page, oh, it's no, yeah, I'm a mess. Yeah. But literally, I sometimes will go back to, uh, I, I know everybody keeps their songs on, in, in their catalog on the computer and it. I go by my book because there's only been two songs in my whole career that were not written in one of these books chronologically. So you can go take these books and go through it and page by page and every song is in there in chronological order and then the new book. That's I know, a, has, it's weird. Has the Nashville Country Music Hall of Fame made a bid yet on those <laughs> notebooks? <laughs> No, but they could be for sale. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Times are tough. Yeah, <laughs> no. that's, that's amazing. <laughs> hey, folks, thanks for listening. Once again, a big thank you to our sponsor for the podcast, Love Justice International. You can follow them on Instagram. It's at lovejusticeintl, or you can go to their website, lovejustice.ngo, and consider donating. Once again, that is lovejustice.ngo, lovejustice.ngo. I would imagine over the course of your career, you've seen seen artists, the span of artists that you've had eyes on, that you've put eyes on is incredible. Um, but also over the course of time, surely you've seen how concurrent with how the music business has changed over time, how artists have changed in terms of their their approach, their, their weaknesses and their strengths. Um, Young artists today, if you were speaking to a young artist that's coming up and not in a critical way, but saying this is typically when I'm right, because you write with a ton of new artists, which mm -hmm. I've always appreciated about you because you, you invest in people. It's just what you do. You don't, you don't try to do it. You just do it because that's your yeah. thing. So having seen that, what is a quality that you see in young artists today that you would say is maybe anemic or maybe is typically underdeveloped now as, as compared to what you used to see? Or are there any weaknesses that you would say for a young artist? I think if you just relax and kind of do your thing, you might have trouble with this because you don't get prepared in this way. What, what are the, what's, what's a quality that you see that, that you would say focus on this and you're going to have a leg up on a lot of on a lot of other artists that are trying to do the same thing you're trying to do. I, I I think I always say find your story, and if you don't have a story, because honestly, a lot of these a lot of people have a story. A lot of young people 
unfortunately, have a lot of drama in their lives, a lot of story. Taylor didn't have drama, but she had an imagination, and she is a gifted, genius, brilliant songwriter. Um, but I think a lot of it is find your story, find your sound, um, figure out who you are, not just on Instagram and TikTok, and figure out who you are and what you want to say, and and be patient. That might take 10 years. Mm-hmm. It may take a while for you to figure that out. But once you do, you're going to go, oh, man, now I get it. Right. Um, so I think it's figuring out who you are that sets you apart from everybody else. You know, we already have a Kelsey Ballerini. We already have a Taylor Swift. We already have a, you know, um, Miranda. But figure out where you fit in. And And the other thing is, is, you got to be open to learning. And that's not saying yes to everything. That's saying, let me think about that, and why would I do that, and how will that affect me in five, ten years? Mm-hmm. So that's the other thing is, is educating yourself on the business mm-hmm. and understanding the business and understanding um, who you want around you and putting a good team together that's going to protect you through all of these stages. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, and being nice to people, because if you're not nice to people, that's a career ender quicker than anything. And these kids don't know it. Some of them just don't know it. Mm-hmm. You know, they get a record deal too fast and, you know, things move too fast and they may be a little out there and outspoken and everybody thinks it's real cute mm-hmm. until they don't. And then these kids are screwed and no one was guiding them. So we've seen that happen, you know. Um, Yeah, because people forget that, that in the music business, you're, you're hanging, you're, this is someone you're going to be around these, these A&R guys, the the managers, you know, the artist is central. And so if you're not nice, if you're not enjoyable to be around, there's a lot of time that you're spending with these people. It's a family. And And, and you've got to be careful who you surround yourself with. I mean, when you watch the people that have been not care, just just made good decisions. And if you can't make good, good decisions, get somebody around you that can help you make those good decisions. Right, right. You know? Right. What do you do or what would you tell an artist when so many times at the core of songwriting, it's, you have to have been through some shit. You have to have lived some life. So what happens when you have, by no fault of their own, a young artist who just has been blessed with good parents, a good life, they haven't gone through a lot of stuff. Is is there is there any way to you know you hate to tell someone to screw up their life just to have some songs to write, but but what what can they do other than just aligning themselves with someone like yourself who is a a, a cynical? Uh, well, I think talented. we can dig it out. I think if there's something going on, we can dig it out. You know, um, if if you know you can you can look at someone else's life, but again. Taylor was, that, that was just, she just has a gift. Right. And so she, she, she did have a charmed life. But any little thing that hurt her, she knew how to write about it and turn it into three minutes of, you know, beauty that everybody got. Mm-hmm. But, you know, most of these kids just want to be star- stars. They just want to be superstars. They want to be, you know, they want to be Beyonce. They want to be, um, you know, Taylor was a songwriter. Right. And she figured out to get people to hear her songs, she would be an artist. And she loved to sing and she loved to entertain. But she was a songwriter. And so here's what would be great is if so, if everybody didn't have to be a songwriter. Mm-hmm. How about you just... If you don't have a story, how about you just let the professionals make it up? <laughs> <laughs> hey, Aretha did it. And it Aretha was well, fine with that. You let's know? talk about Tanya Tucker. Yeah. She never, she didn't write all those songs, but she identified with them. Mm. 
and she made them her own. Mm -hmm. You know, if you listen to Delta Dawn and that Georgia sun's going blood red and going down and, and two sparrows in a hurricane, she trusted people around her to go to the best songwriters in the world mm -hmm. and find those songs. Mm -hmm. And how many of these young artists wouldn't stumble if they would just not worry about it right now. Just go find great songs. Unless you're a songwriter. When did that start? I feel like there was a trend that started. I think it started. I mean, it, it happened in the 90s for a minute. Well, you, do you mean the trend of having to, yeah. the artist had to be in the room? Well, the artist wanting to be the, a songwriter on there. And I think that comes mm -hmm. from a lot of things. I mean, part of it is that that artists aren't they didn't get ready they don't get paid for radio play they don't get paid a performance royalty mm -hmm. which you know these are all long discussions but i think it was like i think the labels went well, wait a minute if you're the so if you write the songs we can take a piece of your publishing right, and i think the right. publishers went well, wait a minute we can sign that artist and make them start writing and i think it just it just evolved. And then after Taylor coming out and saying that she she was 16 and wrote or co-wrote every one of her songs, every little girl in the world wanted to be Taylor Swift and write her own songs. Right. And they're not all Taylor Swift. In fact, not very many of them at all, you know. Um, but then out of that, you wonder you look at an Ingrid Andrus and you look at, you know, you look at, and I don't know why I picked it because she's such a great songwriter. Mm -hmm. You know, I just, there's so many, Kelsey, you know, Kelsey came out of, you know, loving Taylor and learned how to write her songs and has done nothing but try to be a better writer every single time. So, you know, just, um, they don't, everybody doesn't have to be a writer. Right, in some senses, Taylor doing that has probably someone like Kelsey has challenged people to go be a writer and develop the writing piece of their artistry, which is so integral. I mean, that, yeah. pay, that really paves your way nicely if you can do that, right? And in other ways, she's made everybody think that they can write their own songs. Yeah. Well, Carrie yeah. didn't write all her own songs until she finally went, you know what, I've got something to say and, and I think I, I'm gonna take the time to say it and I'm gonna take the time to put myself, you know, she, mm -hmm. she cut great songs, but she's, She's turned into such a great songwriter because she figured out, because she started, you know, telling her stories, which was fantastic. Right, right. Two very different artists, Taylor and Carrie, both extremely successful, but the breadth of the continuum as an artist is so incredible. I mean, it's kind of a cool thing because you, you can... There's so much space for everyone. Going back to your, your comment of finding your story, there's so much space for people. There's space for a Carrie Underwood who's so different than Taylor. Absolutely. And, and um, that's encouraging. Yeah, so, so your advice then to bring it full circle is go find your Liz Rose. Well, maybe you need to go find your Liz Rose in the beginning. And while you're doing that, you find yourself. And, and instead of worrying about being, you know, headlining a tour, what's more important is to sit down and write some stuff down and figure out what you want to say. Um, so that when you do go into that room, you go, well, this is, I don't know how to say this, but this is what I want to say. Can you help me say that? which we always love that. You love an artist, even if they're not really, once you get into it, saying much, just would you say that? Would you not say that? And what's your story? And we've, we, you and I spend a lot of time digging that out, you know? Mm -hmm. And um, so I think that's important is to figure out, like Trisha, for instance, Yearwood, uh, think about, how many times she has to sing she's in love with the boy mm -hmm. yeah she didn't write it but it's a great song and you know you had to think okay you're going to be singing this song for the next 40 years what do you want you know what do you want it to say or what kind of song do you want go find it right right you know i mean and even just 
going back to Taylor's, and you know that initial record that you were a part of, and then listening to what just came out. Ugh. What an amazing example of what you're talking about right now, which is the progression in the lyric. But that songwriter, you can still hear that you could produce those differently, but they right. could have. Exactly. Yeah. Well, she's she found that incredible. She's always had that brilliant melodic sense. Yes, but she's she, too, she is. Coupled she's just, it with this amazing, mature lyric writing in this recent project. I was severely pr impressed by that project. Um, just to hear how heavy that lyric is fighting the melody for they're both so world-class and so strong and just you can just hear her thoughts like just the depth that you're talking about so to your point um seeing someone like taylor be able to come find a you to come alongside her at the beginning and now watch that current current album and see oh. the progression i guess there's there's that uh that She's visual of the amazing. continuum yeah that's that's amazing. So so what you have your hands in a lot of things right now and which I always feel like you like to be busy. You you feel you seem like you're more alive when you're when you're blazing. When you're yeah, kind of popping. I don't like to, to be bored. Yeah. Which so, is not who I ever thought I would be. So <laughs> it's kinda of, it's kinda of crazy. I never just sit and do nothing. Yeah. Um I just had a flashback to Cabo. I was trying to think where you and I first. Oh yeah, met. is Cabo where we first met? I, yeah, I think it is. It you know, was we met in Cabo at a writing retreat for Warner Chapel, and uh, Katie Perlman. That's right. That's it. Yeah, but so you started a publishing company as well, mm -hmm. which is not only full circle because you started in the publishing world, but also very apropos for you because you're such you have such a heart for developing artists and and kind of shepherding them protecting them mm -hmm. um as they come up um which is why i think artists feel so comfortable with you because you're you're a mother bear and you will fuck anybody up who who gets near them and yeah. so they feel safe they feel safe creatively safe professionally um safe personally and uh so talk about the, so how do you pragmatically split your time? Because you're writing a ton, but you've got a publishing company that's operating at the same time. Is Are they amalgamated in a way that allows you to do it? Are they kind of one and the same? Or do you have to flip hats a little bit? Or how does it Not work? Not anymore. I, I, I'm there as a cheerleader or as a, a talent finder or... Um, or to encourage, but I have such a great team. Uh, my son Scott runs a company. Um, Dave Pakula uh, is learning my quirks, and 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 Kate Shirley and Caleb James, and they all know that I respect and trust them to do what I would do, and I really don't micromanage them. I they really give me the freedom to be a writer. Mm -hmm. And if any of the writers need me, I'm available. I'm right there. But they all, they're running the show. It's, it's, uh, um, they're, they're taking care. I am just, I'm a writer there, basically. I'm the boss and everything goes through me, but they run it like I would probably better. And, um, it's really great because these writers are not writing under Liz Rose. They're writing their stories and, and they're just, they're working just as hard um, and having just as much and just as little, you know, uh, success mm -hmm. in this, you know, it's, it's, uh, I, I tell you when, when you know in your heart that if a record comes out and, you and two or three of your writers were up for the record. And you know in your heart that when you don't get that cut, and they do, and you can honestly celebrate for them, you can be a songwriter publisher. Mm -hmm. You have to. You have to be willing to, you have to really feel that in your heart and go, hey, 
you know, we all win. It doesn't matter if it's me or if it's Emily Shackleton, the whole company wins. Mm -hmm. And that is our philosophy. So it's like someone doesn't come along and give me a right because I'm who I am. My people go, who's the best person at this company to write with that artist? And that's how we run it. Hmm. Um, and it's pretty amazing. I mean, we're, we're, we're a big family and there's no, um, you know, there's no uh, hierarchy or anything like that there. They just, and they, they are free to run it. And, and uh, you know, we get together sometimes once a week and talk, but <laughs> they're running it. They're just letting me write songs and don't worry about it until they need me. Careful, Liz. You'd hate to have rumors start that you're running a meritocracy over there based <laughs> on actual, <laughs> actual results and talent. But oh, uh, I just have great people working with me. Mm -hmm. Just great people. Yeah. Well, hell, this has been fun. It's been great. It's Thank been great so to much. see you six feet away. Absolutely. Actually, I think this is about eight feet. Well, we wanted to give extra because Thank I knew you. that uh, if it wasn't exactly six feet or if it was not enough i knew you'd scold me so yes i would um but thank you so much for coming in it's been a blast and let's uh do it again and let's you've inspired me to write again yay good and uh it's 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 been a 25 26 days since that's happened happened wow. so all right well i'll take the credit yeah let's do it thank you thank you this was fun absolutely Thank you, folks. See you later.